A cognitive ontology basically says, what are all the parts of the mind? You know, what are all the things that we think minds do? A lot of the ways that we kind of chop the mind up are almost certainly wrong, where by wrong, I mean they don't reflect the computational organization of the brain. What's the secret? How do you, how do you maintain such a healthy balance while still being productive? You're assuming that I actually maintain a healthy balance. <laughs> <laughs> this is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. When I entered graduate school, I wanted to study consciousness, uh, how our brains give rise to awareness. It didn't take long to realize just how little consensus there was about what consciousness is, <laughs> let alone how to study it. And depending on who you talk to, very little or some appreciable amount of progress has happened in that regard. But even beyond that often contentious question, it may be surprising to realize even the mental functions that we take for granted maybe aren't on as sound a footing as we thought, or as I thought. Um, so if I want to study the neural basis of some mental function, like working memory, for instance, uh, do I even know what working memory is? What other component functions it may involve, or depend on, or overlap with, or relate to? So a while ago, I had David Popel and Yuri Buzaki on to discuss whether neuroscience or psychology uh, provides a better path forward for understanding our mental lives. Today, Russ Poldrack joins me, and we focus more on cognitive ontology, the parts that make up our mental processes, and the relations between those parts. Russell's scientific research over the years has focused on the neural basis of things like decision-making, executive functioning, learning, and memory. But over his career, he's turned a big chunk of his focus uh, onto finding solutions to the many meta-science problems that his own research field has faced. So a few years ago, he co-founded and runs the Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, where they focus on how to ensure that we're essentially doing reliable science that will stand the test of time. Things like establishing standards and making tools for sharing data, sharing analysis tools, and so on. He also wrote the book, The New Mind Readers, What Neuroimaging Can and Cannot Reveal About Our Thoughts which is a great overview about the history and the present and the future of fMRI, which also touches on many of the meta-science problems and solutions. So we also talk a little bit about those kinds of meta-science issues and the field broadly. Show notes at brandinspired.co slash podcast slash 92. Support this podcast on Patreon if you value it and can afford a couple bucks a month. Be good, be well, and enjoy Russell Poldrack. All right, so we're going to start a little bit uh, in left field here, <laughs> Russ. So, so I was thinking about cognitive ontologies, um, and I happen to be in kind of a back and forth conversation with my friends about musical uh, genres. And uh, you're, you're a punk fan, right? Yes. What's a punk band that that you like from the early days? Uh, you know, I was in when I was in high school in the early '80s. I was really into um, the Dead Kennedys, really into all the like Southern California, like SST bands, like Black Flag, uh, okay. Circle Jerks, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, th I knew you were gonna say Black Flag. What, what, what? How would you? What, what musical genre, subgenre is Black Flag? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, I would, I, I would just call it hardcore punk. Okay, so you're going to get in trouble with my friends because I, I wouldn't even go so far as hardcore. I would just probably call it, I might say early punk, but it probably has a, a technical name. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was thinking about cognitive ontologies and thinking about these sub-genre musical labels, pre-punk, post-punk, post-modernism, whatever punk, you know. And I was thinking about how these genres are kind of imposed from the outside, from the critics, while the artists themselves uh, probably many of them resist being labeled, right? So I made this terrible analogy between um, a cognitive ontology, like mental functions that are proposed by psychologists and from anyone who's just thinking about these things, these folk psychological you know, terms and concepts, versus the actual uh, cognitive functions that are resistant to, <laughs> they don't want to be labeled, right? So... <laughs> right. But it's interesting, like, you know, I assume that 
there's if you look at you know the the um the fans of you know the different artists they're probably going to cluster around you know those um those labels right and in some ways that's where the labels probably come from it's an interesting question yeah as to like where you know like where the the right place is to decide that that the the ontology is useful or not and like what what data should go into it i agree that it, it is kind of funny that those are very top down and very much like like what psychologists do yeah and i should say i mean this is a Audio only, but in in the background, Russ has his guitars. At least three of them I see back there. You have a little collection going. Uh, yeah, uh, try not to get any more. <laughs> Very good. Well, so maybe we can apply your uh, cognitive ontology approach to the eventually to the musical genre uh, <laughs> uh, uh, spectrum as well. But Russ, you've been oh, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you've been a major influence um, in you know multiple meta science um issues that are have become big over the past i don't know decade or so things like mm-hmm. the reproducibility crisis just how to do better science in general you're an advocate for open science um you introduced the problem of reverse reverse inference which you've you know talked about at length and will likely come up uh, while we're talking here i'm wondering though how much of your thinking and your career is devoted now to these meta science kind of issues relative to earlier when, you know, how much did you predict you'd be working on these sorts of things when you were uh, earlier in your career? Yeah, no, I certainly did not predict that I was going to be spending, you know, this kind of time on kind of meta scientific issues. I mean, I'd say at least half, if not two thirds of my effort these days, you know, goes to, um, thinking about writing about talking about these kind of meta scientific issues um it really in in the last 5 years it's kind of exploded so when i'm or i guess 6 years i moved to stanford 6 years ago and um was lucky enough to get funding from the Arnold Foundation to start a new center. Um, this was when uh, Chris Gargalewski was part of my group as well before he moved to Google. We started a center together. We called the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience. And, you know, in part, the the decision to kind of, you know, buy into spending that much time on meta scientific issues really came from this kind of growing, gnawing feeling that I had yeah. that I just couldn't believe a lot of the work that I was seeing published. Cause I, you know, it's like I knew all the tricks they were playing. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and it's like, I didn't want to be part of a field when I couldn't like believe or I couldn't know what to believe. Right. I'm sure some, you know, a lot of it is, is reproducible. A good part of it isn't, but I, you know, it's like I couldn't when, when the, when the base rates are as low as I thought they were, it was hard to tell. So, um, so that's really what inspired me to, um, to move in that direction with, you know, the, this intuition that like if we can't, if we can't believe the work that is being published, then, you know, I, one, I don't want to be a part of a field where I can't believe the work that's being published. Right. And it seems unethical to take a bunch of money from the public and, you know, use it to do science when we know that the methods that we're using are broken. I mean, the other issue is that science is a, well, ideally a super slowly, but cor- slow correcting, self-correcting system. And if these problems don't get fixed, uh, you know, a century from now, we're just, our era is going to be a real laughing stock. <laughs> So I guess that's to be avoided. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and so I, you know, I really want to be someone who's doing everything I can to try to figure out how to fix it. It is the most important. Well, I don't, I don't know how to rank importance, but it is a super important problem. So thank you, you know, for for working on these things. I, I'm curious. So you run the the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, and I'm wondering if you would have. So you just said that you know all the the tricks. And, and how these things, you know, happen in papers and whether you should believe it. And I'm wondering if earlier in your career, because you started uh, at, at the center uh, when you were a experienced researcher and at the top of um, your career, perhaps, thus far. And I'm wondering if that makes a difference with respect to, okay, okay looking back now, I can uh, study these things now that I've gotten uh, uh, to this level, or if people should be focusing on that earlier in their careers as, as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, yeah, it almost certainly is the case that some, you know, a, a junior person trying to get tenured in a in a psychology or a neuroscience department doing meta science is going to be very challenging, right? Uh, it was only because you know people knew me as a neuroscientist and a psychologist who has you know done some things that I think are at least 
somewhat impactful in those worlds that I could make this move. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I s- certainly counsel all of the trainees in my lab that, you know, you need to have a uh, fundamentally, you need to be asking scientific questions and doing interesting science. Um, and then, you know, you want to do it obviously in the best possible way. And if, you know, doing some meta science along the way is, you know, something you want to do, then you should do that. But ultimately you're going to be judged for, you know, hiring and tenure promotion on the, yeah. the scientific impact that you make. Yeah. So it's a, I guess that's an evolving question on, on how to proceed, uh, at different stages of, of your career. You, you've stated in the past that you you think of the reproducibility crisis um, while solving it as a design problem. First of all, have you are you familiar with the uh, Designing Your Life book uh, that was written by the uh, Stanford Design uh, team? I'm familiar with it. I haven't read it. Okay. I, it's one of the books that really um, is part of five or six of my go-tos to back just as a, a life the self-help genre that uh, that everyone's really interested in and how to apply principles from design into your life and career. But Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, so what do you, what do you mean when you think of the reproducibility crisis solution as a a design problem? You know, I think about it in terms of choice architecture, this idea from behavioral economics that, you know, whenever we go into a situation, there are features of the situation that were designed either explicitly or implicitly to, you know, drive people towards particular choices. You know, um, the default settings in a software package are the most obvious ones, right? People are mm-hmm. very likely to use whatever default statistical threshold is built in if it's there. And so, you know, using what we know from behavioral economics about it, like how do you modify choice architecture? Uh, you know, Thaler and Sunstein talk about nudges, the idea that we can kind of push people to do the things that we think are the right things to do Mm. without limiting their freedom. You can always choose another threshold, but to the degree that we know that there's something that's a good thing to do, we should make sure that the situation drives people to do that thing. Incentives. Well, it's it's incentives plus um, affordances, right? The, you know, that it's not so much that you're incentivized to use the default, except for the fact that it's easy. Gotcha. I want to ask you one more thing, just based on larger, broader questions before we get into more nittier, grittier stuff. I've heard you give the advice to learn as much technical skills as possible as early on in your career as you can. I mean, when I went into graduate school, all of us, and this relates to uh, open science as well and, and collaborating. When I went into graduate school, I had to learn MATLAB and, um, at, and you know, so did my uh, associates, and we are all learning MATLAB, our own versions of MATLAB, our own, own idiot, making our own idiosyncratic mistakes and awful, awful code. Which, as you know, every year you think now I'm a good coder, and then you look back the next year and you think, ah, oh, it's terrible. But now I'm good. Now I'm good. But everyone had their own style and everything, and you know, specifically just for coding, I'm not even sure if this has changed toward this favor, but. I mean, why is coding not a required class or skill in going into like graduate school, for instance, in, in a science like neuroscience? Yeah, I think it should be. And, and you know, de facto, certainly for my lab, it is, you know, I have a, a blog post where I wrote about graduate study in my lab, what I expect. And I, you know, I used to accept uh, graduate students into my lab who didn't know how to code the idea that they could learn how to code. And I've now realized that, you know, they basically end up spending the first two years of their life yeah. just learning how to code. And so now I basically, you know, say, if you're going to come into my lab, you need to know how to code. Um, but I think that, you know, beyond that, just quote unquote, knowing how to code it doesn't mean that much in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, these issues about quality and and rigor of the coding. You know, I've, in the last year, I've become really interested in software engineering and its role in science um, and kind of thinking about, you know, what we can bring to bear to try to improve the the quality of scientific software. We we recently had an interesting thing that happened in my lab where we had um, we had posted a preprint um, and with it posted all of the code and it was for analyses of this open data set. Um, the ABCD data set and, and the team that, you know, had developed that data set, we were our preprint criticize some of the choices they had made in their um, their design, they dug into our code and found an error, right? And, <laughs> um, and so what, you know, 
they were probably they were probably looking pretty hard for that error. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it was you know it was basically because you know the person who wrote the code had kind of written it in a really kind of obfuscated way with a bunch of like you know nested uh, uh, boolean operations. Um, and so we um, we sat down in the lab and did uh, we wrote a blog post about this um, on our on our uh, reproducibility blog. Um, we basically try to dig in and say, you know, what? Why did this happen? What did we do wrong? Why did this happen? Um, kind of patterning it after. There's this thing that that, that um, happens in the medical world at academic medical centers called the morbidity and mortality conference, where it's basically like a, a <laughs> blame-free zone for talking about <laughs> medical errors or you know possible problems. Um, so we basically did that. We said we we said, look, you know. Everybody makes mistakes. Let's figure out why this happened so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, yeah. I mean, even when I, after I learned to code, when I was a postdoc, every year we would have, at the beginning of a, the semester, we'd have a, a big lab meeting about how we needed to all have combine, be able to combine our code and trade code and work seamlessly. And at the end of the lab meeting, we all felt like, all right. And then we all went back to our offices and continued just as we were only to convene again the next year or semester mm -hmm. with the same issues. I mean, this is an ongoing problem as well because there are so many meta skills to learn coding, how to do science, how to think about things. It seems like there's hardly any time for science. Do you think that this is a big issue or is this just something that we just need to get better at building into the system? No, I think it is a big issue, You know, particularly for people in a field like cognitive neuroscience where you know, there's so much to have to know, right? You have to understand statistics. You have to understand image processing. You under, have to understand how to code. You have to understand how an MRI scanner works. You have to understand neuroscience. You have to understand psychology, right? There's just, you know... You're su supposed to understand all those things anyway. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, yeah it's, and it's sort of an inhuman amount of stuff to expect anyone to know. So the question is, how do you deal with that? I mean, one strategy that people have started proposing, if it can be done is great is this idea of having research software engineers um, who are basically, you know, like right now, most universities have like statistical consultants, right? Who will, you know, you can go to and for free, they'll help you solve your stats problems. And those are often like grad students in the statistics department. Hmm. Um, the idea would be sort of similar to that, having software engineers who one can go to and get help with like software problems, you know, to do a code review or to, you know, whatever the, the issue is that one has with one's code. But obviously, that's, you know, that's something that's going to work well at a, at a well-resourced place like Stanford. A lot of places aren't going to have the resources to, you know, to, to hire people like that. Um, so then the question becomes, you know, how can one try to try to do a better job at software engineering so I, you know, I've been reading a lot of software engineering books lately and <laughs> kind of reading a lot of that literature. And it's really interesting. I've actually, it's, it's sort of not just, you know, sort of impacted the way I think about coding. I, mean, I think it has made me a much better coach in terms of like, you know, helping uh, people in the lab with code review, but it's also kind of given me some thoughts about kind of meta scientific issues as well. Um, but we, for example, you know, in my lab, we now regularly, probably once every month or so do a code review session in our lab meeting where one of the, the trainees in the lab has a piece of code they want to go through and we just kind of walk through it and oh, tear man. it apart and, and try to rebuild it. That's a great exercise for everyone, I think. Yep. Okay, well, um, all right. So these are ongoing issues and uh, I'm glad that people like you are working uh, on them. I've been having some guest questions, and we're just going to start off with a guest question from Kendrick K. And I'm just going to play the question, and, and then you can have at it. My question to Russ, given that he has a nice broad view of many different types of thinking out there, different fields from psychology to fMRI, of course, and uh, computational work. Um, so the question is, I mean, we all have limited resources, so you have to dedicate your resources somewhere. And of course, <laughs> our decisions are, are reflected in our actions. But I guess from your perspective, Russ, if you had limited time to spend on either, and these are loaded terms, of course, theories, so better theory, better modeling, better analysis and software, or better data, where would you put your resources? Okay, so the, the key here is you can't say all of them, of course. <laughs> um, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, and in part, I mean, 
So I can answer it the way, you know, in a personal way. I think that, you know, each individual is probably going to fall in a different place. And in part, it, it depends on kind of, you know, thinking about what your strengths are. I would love to think that I'm like a, a strong theorist or modeler, um, but I just I'm not sure that that that's where my my strengths lie. I think, you know, historically, my strengths have lied in like finding interesting new problems and like doing, you know, doing a, a few experiments on them and then moving on to some other problem rather than like, you know, kind of building compelling theories or models in those areas. So for me, I think it would be, you know, more about spending time on analysis and on data. And that's, you know, cashed out in the way that I've been spending my life. Um, I don't actually think those are the most important things for the field. I think mm. that right now, especially in psychology I, and well, in neuroscience as well, I think that theory is really the thing that we need more of, right? And that we that we need to focus more on, um, because I, you know, I think that there's in the time of the brain initiative, you know, there's been this idea that well, we just need to record more neurons faster and better. Um, and then we'll just understand the brain, right? That understanding will just emerge from the data. And it's become pretty clear that that's, you know, that's just a, uh, an incorrect way of thinking about how science progresses, that we really need, you know, theories to help us understand the data. Um, and so I think actually that, you know, theoretical neuroscience is probably the most important area right now and theoretical psychology as well. Even if, even if that's not the area that my that I have the greatest strengths in, so I wouldn't that wouldn't be the way I would focus. But if I was telling somebody else where to focus, and in part <laughs> this is like you know where do I think that there's the most um, you know the most fruit to be picked, um, that would be theory. Gosh, but it, it's well two things. One, he he guessed that you would say analysis and or software as opposed as opposed for for yourself as opposed to, to theory or modeling or, or data, although you did say data. But, but then um, the question is, how do we you know, change the, the field to, because um, we don't just need theory, we need, we need good theory. So how do we you know, influence the scientific community to uh, promote more of, more of good theory and less bad theory and less data for data's sake sorts of approaches? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think in part, you have to hope that if you have more theory, period, then ultimately, you know, good theory will outweigh bad theory. Um, that's that's a an article of faith rather than a, <laughs> you know a data driven uh, belief. But yeah. um, you need a theory ontology, uh, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't. I mean, I, I think that you know, just kind of getting more people to do theory is the first step. Okay. So you know, before we get into cognitive ontology. I, I kind of want just your broad assessment, um, where we are and where we're headed, um, you know, in neuroscience and and in AI. I'm wondering if you think that we're on the verge of like a paradigm shift, a la Kuhn's, you know, kind of paradigm shift. Because, you know, as the voices like yours rise uh, about, hey, we may be doing it wrong, we need to reorient and rethink how we're going about even doing it. And the questions that we're asking, and reformulate the questions, and so on. Uh, I'm, so I'm just wondering where you think we are in in the current time, and where we might be in the near future. You know, obviously, it's a really exciting time to be doing neuroscience. A lot more exciting for people, you know, working in animal models than in human models. Though even in you know in human models, the you know the imaging techniques have become pretty yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, as I've already said, I think that we're that, you know, we're in a relative glut of theory. The the the, the big hole that I see is one that um, that I think is has been characterized well in a couple of recent papers. One was by John Krakauer and his colleagues. Um, and then Yael Niv just had a preprint recent, recently on the primacy of behavioral research for understanding the brain. Rolling my eyes, but OK. <laughs> <laughs> um so I think that, that, you know, if you if you interact, if you're a psychologist or a cognitive neuroscientist and you interact much with people who do cellular and molecular neuroscience, they don't even hide rolling their eyes often when you talk about, you know, psychological theory or, mm -hmm. you know, or imaging results, right? And there are, there are certainly reasonable 
uh, questions one can ask about psychological theory of imaging results. But, um, but I think that there's an idea, there's this kind of very deep seated reductionism in a lot of cellular and molecular neuroscientists that, well, you know, once we understand the circuits and the ion channels and, you know, and all these sort of things at the cellular molecular level, we don't need to care about all that goofy psychology stuff. Right. <laughs> so, um, and I, here's, here's an example of a place where I think, you know, this is a problem, right? So if you look at, the pages of cell, right? The, I think the journal with like the highest impact factor, you regularly see papers with titles like, you know, depression involves a disruption in circuit X, right? Mm -hmm. Where that circuit is defined in like these amazingly precise terms of like, you know, specific sets of neurons in particular regions with particular types of connections. But the, the, what they don't tell you is what is, they say depression involves a disruption, but it's really, a rodent model of depression that has tenuous validity for the human depression phenotype, right? So we have these, these amazingly precise biological models built around like really imprecise and often invalid models of the psychological phenomenon. What would be a better way to word that? Well, I think, I think saying a, you know, anhedonia in a mouse model of depression <laughs> involves a disruption in circuit X, right? But that doesn't sound as... That doesn't yeah. sound as, as fancy. Right. A, a little bit lower impact, I suppose. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, this is an... Uh, John Krakauer rails against this this sort of... Um, the, the exact same that, thing that you just described. Um, and I don't know. It's so strange to me. I, I just have a hard time believing that that's still the case. That um, maybe within the cell and molecular neurobiology world, I just think of it all as being... <laughs> everybody's multi-level and thinking about all these things and all the different levels are interacting. But am I just naive in thinking that? Or just is it because I came from a monkey neurophysiology lab where we attempted to tie spiking rates to higher cognitive functions and so on? I think um, it is that you're naive and it is also because you came from a systems neuroscience lab that I think, you know, takes cognition seriously. Certainly people in systems neuroscience, I think, are, are much more in general, much more open to, you know, taking seriously the psychological side. But uh, but that, you know, the, the papers in cell are not being done by them, right? They're being right. done by circuit busters who, you know, really care about, you know, doing optogenetics on these very particular circuits. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a deeper problem, I think, that actually the, the issue that I have with, you know, with the way that John and Yael and sort of others have kind of framed this critique is I think it actually goes deeper than, than this idea that behavior is the bottleneck, right? So they frame it in terms of, oh, we have, we have to understand behavior, right? right. So, but when I, you know, so, in part, this is kind of, you know, speaks to where I came from, right? When I was starting graduate school in cognitive psychology, the, you know, the memory of the cognitive revolution was still fresh in the faculty's minds. And so my, you know, my training instilled in me this deep sentiment that you can't understand behavior without understanding the mental representations and the processes that underlie it, right? Um, so it's, you know, obviously understanding behavior is really important. Um, and characterizing behavior well. And I think a lot of the, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool work that's being done and kind of, you know, building, especially in like, you know, rodent models, building models of, of, you know, the behavioral repertoire of animals. But I think that's not going to get us to where we want to be. Um, and unfortunately, so, you know, Yael points out some examples of this in her paper. Work focused at that cognitive level is increasingly shunned by the funding agencies. Mm, um, right. You know, so it's like it's as if, you know, Noah was focused on understanding weather, but they were to say, you know, one of our missions is to understand coastal flooding. But since water is made of quarks, we're only going to fund research that uses high energy physics techniques. <laughs> right. 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 There's I think there's this like there's this naive and sort of implicit kind of eliminated reductionism amongst a lot of neuroscientists. Right. Who really think that that, you know, once we understand the neurons, then everything else is just going to kind of fall into place. But they're and kind of not recognizing as legitimate these kind of higher levels of, you know, kind of emergent organization like the cognitive level. Well, highlight of the uh, podcast thus far, uh, Russell Poldrack called me naive. Mm. And <laughs> I mean, I, I really, I, I must be naive because, uh, yeah, Maybe I maybe I'm just looking at all at all through rose colored glasses. It's just hard for me to believe that people do have that notion that it will all just work out if we figure out the structure, the, what's connected to what, and the implementation level stuff. 
Yeah, and you know the C. Elegans example kind of you know yes. shows that that, <laughs> that strategy is not going to get you to where you want to be, even in terms of understanding behavior. So there's certainly good evidence that it doesn't work. Yeah, well, we could spend we could spend all day talking about just this, but um, <laughs> let's move on and get closer to cognitive ontology. But so so you've been thinking about this kind of stuff for a long time. And there's this old, you know, phrenology approach that you've highlighted in blog posts and such that areas of the brain do mental things. You can map on mental functions uh, to areas of the brain. And, you know, you talk about that uh, in your book, The New Mind Readers. Um, You talk about how, you know, what we have known, you know, the history of fMRI, what we can know and what we can't know based on fMRI and, um, you, you know, detail the reverse inference problem. Uh, in in that book, which I, I really recommend, it's a great overview of fMRI, uh, but it also starts to touch on some of these cognitive uh, ontology issues. I'm wondering how your thoughts about fMRI in general, as a tool for understanding minds, uh, has changed over time. I know that you weren't, you didn't, didn't initially think you were going to be doing fMRI work when you when you started your career, but you were sucked into it. That's right. Yeah. In fact, I was. It's funny in graduate school. You know, so I I got my PhD in 1995. fMRI was kind of invented in 1992. So in the early 90s, you know, a lot of people were still doing PET research. There was some, you know, new fMRI work coming out. It was all pretty low-hanging fruit kind of work. Like, hey, we show people words and this part of the brain lights up. And if you show them scrambled words, it doesn't. So, you know, it, it, it was easy to ridicule. And so when I went to do my postdoc, I wasn't really interested in doing imaging. I wanted to do patient work looking at, you know, basal ganglia and skill learning. And for various reasons, I ended up getting sucked into doing imaging in part because I'm a geek and I like, you know, messing around with computers and data. Um, and that's something you do a lot of in, in fMRI. <laughs> so am I, am I more or less uh, enthusiastic about the ability of fMRI to inform our understanding of the mind? I think that I'm fairly optimistic in at least in one particular way. I think that, you know, the there's there's ways that people have started to use um, you know, imaging fMRI in the last decade that I think do have a much better ability to actually tell us something interesting theoretically. So, you know, in the in the early days you would, you know, do some subtraction. Let's say I, you know, show yeah. people high frequency words and low frequency words and look at the difference in brain activity between those and then try to, you know, kind of find the regions that are differentially active and say something about their function. That's not that useful, I think, for psychological theory, right? Because if I have a theory about, you know, word frequency, um, it probably, it's a psychological theory that probably doesn't say much about where in the brain that lives. Now, you can imagine, like, if we know the computations that different brain areas are doing, we could kind of use that to help understand what that activation might tell us. And I think that's a strategy that, you know, that has been at least a little bit successful. But I think that the the more useful strategy for telling us about cognitive theories, even though it's not clear to me that it's really been cashed out fully yet, is this kind of like pattern similarity idea. The idea being that when we do pattern similarity analysis in fMRI, what we're doing is basically saying, instead of saying, you know, what regions are more active than others, what we do is we say, you know, across a bunch of stimuli or task conditions or whatever it might be, what's the similarity structure of patterns of activity across the whole brain or in particular regions? And then we can use that. So, so for example, you know, most theories, even if they don't, most psychological theories, even if they don't say anything about kind of where in the brain things live, they almost certainly say something about the degree to which, you know, different stimuli should be processed in a more similar or different way, Mm -hmm. right? So, Mm -hmm. so now you using pattern similarity analysis, you have a way to start actually testing predictions about theories or, you know, either theories as a whole, or the other thing you can start doing is saying, well, you know, I think often in, in the history of psychology, we've had this kind of pathological binarization of hypotheses, right? We have, we've had all these debates, like, is it serial or, or parallel processing? Is it analog or propositional information, right? And, you, you know, almost every time when we have those debates, um, people end up realizing that the debate was pretty much kind of off base and, you know, kind of a little bit of both of them are right. 
the one thing you could imagine is that we can now start saying, well, it may well. So let's take, for example, in, um, you know, categorization. Some people think that categorization relies on memory for exemplars. Other people think categorization relies on some kind of prototype, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, it may well be that only one of those theories is right, but it may also be that different brain systems implement different of those processes. So now you can use pattern similarity to say, well, this one system looks more like an exemplar system. This other system looks more like a, a prototype system. Um, and I think that starts to let you much more closely tie psychological theory to uh, to brain function. It's never simpler than than you conceive of it. It's always more complicated than... than <laughs> it's never <laughs> exactly. an either or. Yeah. I mean, has that sort of, you know, the development in fMRI and the way that you've thought about that, has that also uh, altered over time your conception of our minds? It's an interesting question. I mean, I, it's impossible to isolate that specific. How has the fMRI it specifically <laughs> changed? But maybe even more broadly, how's, you know, your, your, you know, it has your conception of mind changed over time? And if so, can you articulate how? I think the the main way that it's changed is become more computational. You know, I started out from a tradition, you know, I, I did my PhD working in a lab that focused on memory and memory disorders. And, you know, that's a very kind of box and arrow model yeah. type of field, or at least it was back in the 1990s. And obviously, people have been doing computational modeling, you know, of various sorts in, you know, across psychology um, for a long time. So, in some ways, I'm just kind of catching up with where the field has been going. But, you know, one of the things I've been really struggling with lately is how to think about, you know, what does a cognitive ontology look like when it's framed in terms of computation rather than in terms of, you know, what you might call folk psychological concepts, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, most I did an analysis. I wrote a blog about it a few years ago, where I I took all the terms from the cognitive atlas, which you know basically just tries to describe all the different parts of the mind that we think we know about as psychologists. Um, I took all those terms and used um, the Google Books uh, database to ask how many, what proportion of these terms were in the literature in the English literature starting back going all the way back to eighteen hundred. <laughs> and basically what I found was, you know, like the the cognitive atlas terms, I think like in for the the single words that are in the cognitive atlas, like 80% of them were in the English language as of, you know, 1800. And for the phrases, you know, the majority of them were in the English language, certainly by, you know, the early 1900s. Whereas if you take the gene ontology, which is this, you know, probably the best known kind of biomedical ontology that describes the parts of cells, molecular uh, functions, and biological processes, very little of those terms were in the literature until well after 1900. So it says that, you know, that, you know we're using this set of terms. You know, also, if you look at William James's 1890 uh, you know, Principles of Psychology, the, heading, the chapter headings there are, you know, other than the way they're worded, are things that people are studying today. Um, and so, our, you know, our, the way that we chop up the mind certainly has not changed in more than 100 years. Um, I think that the computational turn is a really big change in the way that we think about this, right? So one of the things that I've been trying to think about is like, how do we rethink describing the organization of the brain in computational terms? And the, the, an intuition pump for this has really been the, the work over the last few years that's been using uh, deep neural networks to try to understand um, the visual system. So I, the work that I know best is the work from Dan Yeamans and Jim DiCarlo, mm -hmm. um, you know, where they basically, you know, take a, take a deep neural network um, or really take a, a, a class of hierarchical convolutional neural networks and examine, you know, train them to recognize objects without telling them anything about the brain. And then um, also simultaneously, you know, or in parallel record from, non-human primates in the visual system, basically recognizing those same objects across the, the ventral visual stream. And then they, you know, what they see is that you can well predict the activity of neurons from the activity in different layers of that hierarchical neural network. And so the question is like, what, what have we learned when we do that? So let's say that, you know, area V4 is best predicted. Its activity is best predicted by convolutional layer five in this particular deep neural network. What have I learned about what V4 does mm -hmm. 
by knowing that, right? And one answer might be, well, it does the thing that convolutional layer five does and, you know, that you can't really say anything more than that. And I think that's the way that my colleague Dan Yamans kind of views it is that, you know, trying to put verbal labels, functional verbal labels on these things, you know, it doesn't really make sense because ultimately it's described in terms of the computations, the, you know, particular transformations of information that are being performed by those layers in the network. But I, as a psychologist, I have this, I think, deep-seated need to give a kind of a low-dimensional verbal description yeah. to, you know, to what that, um, to what that particular circuit or system or region or network is doing. So do you think that then in that case, and we may, may come back to this because we'll back up in just a second, but in that case, right, so we have this um, intuition that a given area of the brain needs to do something, right? And needs to have a function. And in this particular case, uh, let's say a V4, uh, we need to be able to uh, look at uh, what it's doing and give a name to it. But uh, the low dimensional description that we that we give to that kind of processing is that it is a fairly higher step in the ventral visual stream on the way to object uh, categorization or object identification. And, you know, is that where it ends? Is that that how we describe is that is that where our ability to uh, put words and phrases to this in a low dimensional space ends that we have then we describe the actual trajectory of the layers versus what each layer is doing at each given step or because you know in v1 it might be a little bit easier right contrast enhancement uh, line detection things like that and it may just get more and more abstract or maybe we need to invent new terms or maybe we need to use equations as uh, you know computational equations what is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th you know, obviously there's lots of strategies that people have used. Um, so for example, you can try to ask, you know, you can take the neural network and kind of do in silico electrophysiology and ask like, what are the stimuli that best activate, you know, these particular units in the network and then kind of look at those and say, ah, eh, that kind of looks like a high level feature that's like an object or it looks like a lower level feature and has a smaller receptive field or a bigger receptive field. You know, there's various tricks you can play, but ultimately it's not clear what those buy you, what kind of predictions you can make or what kind of understanding you get about the system that's sort of useful beyond, you know, kind of what the network. Uh, Being a step in a process or something. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Maybe we'll revisit this, but all right, let's talk ontology and cognitive ontology. So the word ontology um, in philosophy, as you as you have pointed out in, in your papers, has to do with what's real, what things exist uh, in the universe or that really exist, no matter what we call them. What, what are the real things that exist? But a cognitive ontology is slightly different than that. So what is a cognitive ontology? And, and then why do we need one? <laughs> yeah, so I, a cognitive ontology or a you know, what is called often a biomedical ontology or a formal ontology is, you know, rather than being a, a description of what really exists in a kind of a metaphysical way, it's really a description of what we think exists, right? How do, what it's a, it's a basically a formalization of our conceptualization of the world, right? So like the gene ontology says, what are all the parts of a cell? What are all the things, you know, what are all the processes that a biological system does, right? So a cognitive ontology basically says, what are all the parts of the mind? You know, what are all the things that we think minds do, right? And so those could be things like memory. Those could be things like, you know, task set shifting. They could be high level. They could be low level. Um, and then they're, you know, in a biomedical ontology, they're generally described in terms of a specific set of formal relationships, things like, you know, X is a kind of Y or A is a part of B. And so that's what that's the way that we think about, you know, a, a cognitive ontology. Now, why do you need it? Well, well, or let's ask a question a different way. Why did I start spending time working on this? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I started thinking about this uh, more than 10 years ago, back when I was at UCLA, um, sort of inspired by my colleague, Bob Builder, um, who, you know, was thinking a lot about, you know, gene ontologies and and how we might, you know, kind of bring to bear those sort of ideas on psychology. And so we, you know, we basically, I was inspired to think about like, you know, what are, what are the things that we're mapping onto the brain, right? So one of the, one of the terms that's, that sometimes used to describe the enterprise of cognitive neuroscience is quote unquote brain mapping, right? right. Um, so the question is like, what are, if you're going to map 
things, you need to know what the things are that you're mapping on to the places, <laughs> right? right. Um, and so the question is like, what are the things? And in part, you know, I, I sometimes like to say that there was sort of a subversive agenda around the cognitive atlas, which is, you know, I went into this being pretty sure that, um, that you know, a lot of the ways that we kind of chop the mind up, these ways that we inherited from, you know, from William James et al., are almost certainly wrong, where by wrong, I mean they don't reflect the computational organization of the brain. Um, but if we want to figure out where how we're wrong, we need to kind of figure out exactly what it is that we believe to start with, right? So the in some ways, it was like, you know, let's write everything down as precisely as we can so we can figure out how to break it. Can you just describe what the cognitive atlas is? This is kind of where you store your the cognitive ontology, I suppose, is one way yes. to say it. Yeah, so the Cognitive Atlas is a website that was sort of inspired by Wikipedia. You know, uh, it's meant to be kind of a community project, so anybody can come on and sort of contribute knowledge. And basically, it um, it outlines, it describes two separate, at least two separate sets of things. Um, the main two sets of things are what we call um, cognitive concepts or mental concepts. These are the these are the latent things that we can't see but that we think exist in the head. Things like Working memory. Working memory, exactly. Yeah, okay. And then we then we have a separate kind of description of what we call mental tasks. These are the things that we measure the mind with. And one of the, one of the really problematic moves that people in psychology and neuroscience often make is basically equating tasks with functions, right? Yeah. They'll call something a working memory task, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? That's a theory of what is involved in performing that task, right? And the task almost certainly involves lots of other things. You know, we coming from the memory world, we always had this saying that like no task is what we call process pure, right? And this is basically just trying to highlight that fact that, you know, tasks and processes are not isomorphic. Um, and so we, we try to describe the relationships, you know, what are all the parts of the mind? What are all the relationships between them, right? So... Is working memory a kind of memory? Um, is you know visual selective attention a kind of uh, visual attention, and so on? And then we try to describe how those things are measured by particular contrasts or comparisons on particular tasks. And there, there are formal. Then, then the goal is to define formal relationships between the tasks and the concepts uh, and the activations in the brain related to uh, those tasks and concepts. Correct. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the neuroscience part is kind of the next step. The idea is that we start with these, um, these formal relationships between particular tasks and particular measures on task and particular cognitive functions. And then we, the idea is like, well, now what we, what we can do is get data on those tasks and ask various questions. So for example, you know, my student, uh, John Walters right now is doing a project where um, he basically takes people doing – there's a data set that um, Jörn Diedrichsen, Rich Ivory, Maeve King collected that, that I was involved in, in sort of helping them analyze. We published uh, in Nature Neuroscience last year. Um, it's this multitask data set where people do 40-something different task conditions. And so what John has been doing is basically – Taking all those tasks and a group of us sat down and basically annotated each of the tasks to say, for each particular like comparison of task conditions, what psychological functions do we think are tapped by or required to perform this task? And that's not always clear. And sometimes, you know, we can spend an hour or two talking about one task. Um, but we've done that for that set of tasks. And now he's building models to basically say, okay, so can we train? So actually models that are inspired by, you know, work that people have been doing in the, the visual neuroscience literature for a while, most prominently the work of uh, Jack Allen and colleagues using encoding models. The idea being like, you know, you build a model that relates cognitive functions to brain activity, and then you test the model by predicting patterns of brain activity for tasks that the model specific combinations of, of cognitive processes that the model has never seen mm -hmm. and we're actually finding we can surprisingly to me given that i thought our cognitive ontology was pretty bad we can actually do pretty well at predicting brain activity patterns on tasks that we've never seen before based on an annotation of what cognitive functions we think are are involved in those tasks i mean this is a set of um we were well we were going to get into this later but um Anyway, this is a set of 
you know, multiple tasks and multiple, I mean, the whole idea is to, to do this sort of in mass. And then, then you can really um, figure out where the lines are and, and the joints are. And that's how the, the, the modeling works so well, I suppose. That's right. Yeah. And even, you know, 40 something task is a pretty, is spanning a very small part of the psychological space, right? And, and then in this, this in part was my motivation for about a decade ago, getting into the data sharing business. You know, there's obviously there's a reproducibility angle for the data sharing idea, but there's also the idea that like my lab is never going to be able to collect data on all the tasks that we would like to collect data on in order to do this kind of mapping. Yeah. Um, and so if I can get a lot of other people to share their data, then that allows us to be able to, you know, expand the set of things that we can try to model. Now, the, the problem there has turned out to be this annotation issue, right? That to do this right, each of the task comparisons needs to be sort of annotated using something like a cognitive atlas to say, what functions do we think are engaged in this particular comparison? And that's just a time-consuming enterprise. Mm. Uh, and so doing that on you know hundreds or thousands of tasks is just really challenging. People don't do this in their papers in general. It's interesting, back in the 90s, you would regularly see papers that would have like a little sort of a chart showing like, what do, what do I think all the subtractions in my analysis, what psychological functions are they tapping into? Um, and this was particularly common back at when people were doing pet imaging. And you just don't see that anymore. I think, you know, people don't think as deeply about, um, you know, the, the implications of subtraction as like isolating particular cognitive functions. This is, a, I think, a good point to... Uh play the second question here that I have from you. This one's from, and then, and then I want to go back and, and talk about what you've been describing so far as, is kind of a top down approach. And you also do a bottom up approach to, uh, to developing a cognitive ontology. But, uh, before we get too deep into it. So I had David Popol and Yuri Buzaki on the show, uh, talking about whether we should go from top down, which should have epistemological primacy, psychology and naming these mental functions. And that's uh, and then we confirm it with neural data. Or Yuri, his preferred approach, which I'll ask you about in a little bit, is to uh, look at neural data and try to infer maybe not mental functions, but um, at least properties of the neural data that will uh, help us better uh, maybe build a cognitive ontology, uh, for instance, um, of mental functions. But all right, so here's here's David's question. Hi, Russ. It's David. I hope all is well and good and that you're having fun talking to Paul. So I'm very sympathetic to the problem you're grappling with here, and I like the framing of defining ontologies. I wonder how you handle the tension between ontologies that come from different ways of approaching the problem. That is to say, the ontologies we derive from psychological investigation or text mining or the cognitive sciences are of one form, and the ontologies we might derive from biology straight up are quite different. And so we end up with ontologies that are not necessarily well aligned or even linkable. And I wonder if you think you have an approach to deal with this problem or if you think one or the other ontological type actually has, a, let's say, a kind of epistemic priority. In any case, I think it's a really important problem and I'm excited about uh, pursuing it further and I'm glad you're working on it. Okay. Thank uh, you, Great David. question. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I do not believe that any of these individual levels has an epistemic priority and I'll look forward to discussing that, you know, in a bit more when we talk about Yuri's uh, ideas. Um, I guess I take some degree of inspiration from the gene ontology, right, which talks about things that are, are in principle very different, right? It talks about parts of cells, right? Endoplasmic reticula and lysosomes and all those sorts of things, right? Which are very different from molecular functions, right? Phosphorylation or right. um, or biological processes like, you know, uh, citric acid cycles, right? Those, you might think that those are like very different things, but they're re obviously related in, you know, the sense that Particular molecular functions are required in order to achieve particular biological processes, and particular parts of cells implement particular biological processes or molecular functions. And so you can, even though they're different, they're 
you know, ontologically very different types of things. Some of them are, and actually the, you know, the parallel with, uh, with minds is really interesting, right? Because some of them, you know, obviously parts of brains are observable things, right? We can see neurons in CA1. We know that they're physically present things. Um, we can't see memories, right? We might be able to see the traces of that memories are associated with in physical brains, but we can't see a memory because a memory is a an abstract latent thing, right? Similarly, we can't see the uh, TCA cycle, right? We can see the you know the evidence of particular molecular functions in particular parts of cells but the TCA cycle is also kind of an abstract thing and so the you know i i think that we can actually hope to relate these things if we going back to the comments earlier about this kind of a limitative reductionism if we you know kind of buy the idea that there really are you know a set of you know hierarchically organized levels of organization, none of which is primal in a sense. Obviously, you know, the higher level ones depend on the lower level ones, but they're not it's not as if they can be reduced to the lower level ones. If there's an there's a, a a level of organization that emerges that can't simply be described in terms of the the, the lower level. So this is a, he had kind of a follow up uh, related, um, wondering whether what you're after uh, are you know, these kind of irreducible primitives, or rather if they're parameters, he says, with respect to a theoretical level of abstraction, right? So that uh, this almost kind of yep. gets back to the metaphysics of it. Um, you know, are they irreducible primitives like particle physics, right? Yeah, um, or, you know, whatever the basis is of uh, all matter or something. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, um, I like the idea that they're parameters in a theoretical framework, in part because I don't think we can ever get out from behind our uh, theories, be they, you know, implicit or explicit. And this relates to this idea of kind of, you know, learning everything from the bottom up. So I, I agree that, that, you know, a good way to think about this is, you know, we have, we have some kind of basic assumptions about how minds should be chopped up, right? Um, and then what we're doing here is basically saying, now let's go in and, you know, name, given that strategy for chopping things up, let's name the parts that we have chopped up. Mm. Okay. So, um, I, you know, be before we move on and des describe a little bit more like the, the actual approaches that you've taken to this, I'm uh, just broadly, I'm wondering how much progress actually depends on getting the ontology right. And you know, of course, embedded in that is like, how do we know how right it is, for instance? <laughs> it, you know, it's an interesting question. It, I think it does simply because, um, you know, in other in part, in other sciences, you know, we think that moving towards a, a more accurate ontology has been associated with more, you know, effective outcomes in those sciences, right? And so in this case, you know, if our goal is to come up with mechanistic models of how brains give rise to mental life and to action... Um, it seems that if we're not chopping up mental life or behavior in a way that is like, you know, truly reflective of the, the mechanisms that generate it, then we're going to be fundamentally limited in how well we can do, right? So if we, if we were to have, you know, I, I use this, um, this thought experiment sometimes of like, what would have happened if the phrenologists had gotten their hands on fMRI? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> They did. The, the answer is right. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, the faculty psychology phrenologist, Gall, right? If, if okay. they had, if they had asked, you know, can we now use fMRI to map our quote unquote mental organs like phyloprogenitiveness and uh, suavity, you know, onto the brain? <laughs> you have to know that they. It, it's not like they would have found nothing, right? They would have found something. And, you know, that doesn't mean that their way of chopping up the brain is correct. In fact, they probably would have found something similar to what we find, which is that, you know, there's a ton of different supposedly distinct psychological functions that all give rise to very similar patterns of activity in the brain. You know, the anterior cingulate is activated in something like a quarter of all psychological or a quarter of all neuroimaging studies, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so clearly we have not learned much, I think, about what that area does in terms of its, you know, its ultimate function, at least from that, you know, from, from the, the larger body of that work. 
Yeah. Okay. Just, I mean, there's a trap question. I just want to make sure that there was a good reason for us to go ahead with a cognitive ontology. So, so like I was mentioning before, you've taken, um, well, multiple approaches to this. Broadly, you've taken a top-down approach and, and a bottom-up approach, but even within the top-down approach, by top-down, I mean, you've sort of, sort of started with our theories of mental functions and our names of those mental functions kind of started with psychology, I suppose you could say, and used that method to break down the ontology. And um, sort of in parallel, I don't, maybe you can discuss whether it's in parallel or more recent, but there's this bottom-up approach uh, where you start with observations and you correlate uh, observations in tasks and in surveys. Um, You correlate your way to developing a new, uh, to generating an, an ontology. So, I'm just going to ask you to take us, because you already talked a little bit about about um, the top-down approach, but I'm just going to ask you to maybe describe a little bit more both of those approaches and, and what you've found regarding um, you know our current ontology, which you've already said surprised you. Yeah. So the, as I mentioned, the, the work that we've been doing you know, based on the kind of top-down ontology models to look at how well can we predict brain activity based on those models we're you know we're far away from being able to predict all the brain activity but we certainly do much better than i would have expected suggesting to me that at least in part there's something right about those models and then now the question is going to be where does it break down so yeah the the work on data driven ontologies is really more recent it started with a, a student in my lab um several years ago ian eisenberg um and i you know i had been walking around with ideas about trying to do kind of data-driven ontology development for a while, but none of my students would ever kind of get very interested in it. And in part, I thought it was sort of too dangerous of a project to, yeah. to kind yeah. of give to a grad student. But but Ian, you know, jumped on it and really wanted to do this project. And so, so and it, it was in concert with, you know, a, a, a set of ideas that we were just developing um, with some collaborators around um, and sort of driven by interest from NIH in developing an ontology of self-regulation, right? So self, quote unquote, self-regulation is a term that's used in many different ways in many parts of psychology. You know, people in my part of psychology might talk about, you know, response inhibition or delay discounting being an aspect of self-regulation. People in, you know, social psychology might think about, you know, self-control or, you know, people in, in health psychology might think about impulsivity, Um, So there's lots of different ways that this gets cashed out, sometimes in cognitive tasks that measure, you know, reaction time and accuracy, sometimes in self-report where I answer questions like, you know, do I make impulse buys at the grocery store? Right. Um, (laughs) Right. And so we um, sort of we we obtained some funding from NIH to to go after this question specifically in the context of self-regulation. So what we did was generated a battery. We sort of looked across psychology and said, you know, as broadly as we can, can we pick a bunch of different measures that are all thought to to kind of index different aspects of self-regulation from different standpoints. And we basically, it was like a 10-hour battery. And so we got uh, a little over 500 people to complete this 10-hour battery all online. And so we had data from them doing, you know, lots of different tasks. And then we basically just took this, you know, this very standard approach from psychology for a long time of using, you know, multivariate analysis, like factor analysis to ask, to look at the structure in the data, right? So it's sort of like an unsupervised, you know, approach to looking at the structure in the data. And there is, there's a lot of structure in the data. So for example, you know, we had several different measures of how much a person discounts future rewards. Those are all highly correlated with one another. We also had several measures of how well you can inhibit a motor response, the me- which are also correlated with one another and not really correlated at all with the measures of, of, uh, of delay discounting. But in that in that analysis, don't you have to tell the algorithm how many clusters to create? <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh. Um, <laughs> and this turns out to be the the trickiest part of this. Um, and and it, well, because then then you're sort of defining how many mental uh, categories there are, right? Yep. Yep. And so, um, you know, in part, this is why I think I've become a lot less enthusiastic about. The idea that we can sort of just use data to infer the joints in the system. So there's a, um, you know, in some ways, this is very similar to the clustering problem in machine learning. So there's a paper by um, Ulrika von Luxburg and colleagues from a few years ago called Clustering Science or Art. <laughs> um, and they basically, you know, outline this idea that that there's no way of defining a quote unquote correct clustering solution for any data set that 
the decision about which clustering solution is best has to depend on the end goals of the researcher, right? So, for example, in our you know in our work, we use uh, Bayesian information criteria and BIC to determine the quote unquote optimal number of uh, factors in our factor analysis, right? But um, but that's a you know, using that particular criterion makes particular assumptions about how much we want to penalize, you know, parameters versus versus sample size. Um, we could have used AIC, we could have used cross validation, and those all give us different answers about the optimal number. Now that you know, the fortunately, the the story that one might tell is not that different, right? You know, if I if I get a a, a cluster solution with say or a, a factor analysis where I say there's 20 factors as opposed to five. If you look at the 20, you can usually see that, well, they all kind of emerge from the five. It's not mm -hmm. like they're telling you something completely different. They're giving you a kind of a more detailed view of what you would have, of the kind of the, the, the lower dimensional view you would have gotten with, with fewer. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, it tells me that, um, that this idea that you can just kind of look at the data and have the structure emerge without any sort of like pre-existing theoretical uh, framework is is just an untenable idea. Well, it also makes one hesitate to uh, speaking of ontology, and I know this is not about the the metaphysically real things in in the universe, but then if you ha if you can tell the same story with a cluster of five versus a cluster of seven, what you want to be able to say. And even like moving forward, relating brain to mind, let's say, let's say they do equally well, the five cluster model versus the seven cluster model, you'd still feel kind of hesitant to believe in the mental function <laughs> that you're purporting in those clusters, right? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I think clearly one can, you know, there's an argument, right, that the the data, the structure in the data to some degree has to come from the mechanisms that are generating the behavior, Right. And the, the question is, to what degree do you attribute the structure and the data to the, the kind of fundamental joints mm -hmm. versus, for example, the particular choices of tasks or, you know, so for example, you know, we, um, one of the big distinctions that we see in our data is that behavior on self-report questionnaires is pretty much unrelated, uncorrelated with behavior on cognitive task, measuring reaction time and accuracy. Um, and that might be that they're reflecting, you know, fundamentally different types of, um, you know, different types of psychological functions. It might also be, you know, what people in psychometrics call methods variance, right? That it's really something about the way that you're measuring the things that's causing those correlations. And so, for example, oh. you know, people differ in the degree to, to which they want to, um, you know, present a positive view of themselves or not, right? And so that's going to cause all the the self report things to covariance to to covariate with one another right and not with the reaction time tasks there's lots of stories like that one can come up with yeah uh, I interrupted you a I think uh, talking about you know what you actually found with this bottom up approach right so what we found was that you know we we certainly see that um, that there's interesting structure in the um, you know in the cognitive tasks and in the uh, the self report. Um, and then we wanted to ask basically, you know, how well do those relate to the things out in the world that we think are associated with self-control? Things like, uh, you know, smoking or overeating or um, success in life in some sense, like, you know, household income and, and education level and things like that. And basically what we saw was that, you know, we could, using a kind of a cross-validated out-of-sample predictive model – we could predict pretty well those various measures of kind of real world uh, outcomes using the self-report measures. We could hardly predict anything using the cognitive task measures. That's crazy. That's probably the the most important finding I think from that work, which you know throws a bit of water on you know when 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 I and many of my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience you know write grants, we say, hey, we're going to study response inhibition because it's so important for addiction, right? Yeah. And um, these data suggest that, you know, if it is, it's kind of really weakly important. And it's actually more important to listen what a person <laughs> believes about themselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so where does this leave us? Um, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the current state in your current thinking about uh, the cognitive ontology? I mean, I think that 
regardless of you know the 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 bottom up stuff i think that there's still insights to be gotten from the top down analysis and and i think in part it points to our need to be much more uh, precise in defining exactly what it is that our cognitive tasks are measuring um so on the one hand i'm i'm optimistic that we can still make progress there on the other hand you know i think that that i've become convinced that ultimately an ontology that's written down in words is probably never going to be a particularly powerful ontology compared to one that's written down in some kind of computational language. Um, and then the question becomes like, what does that computational language even look like? Well, that that's a good question. I, I just immediately, a graph network, of course, popped into my head. But so do you have an idea? I can't say that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem I've been struggling with a lot in the last year. I gave a talk, I guess, a couple of years ago now at this ontology conference, this philosophy conference, where I kind of first started, you know, thinking about this particular issue. And I can't say I've made great progress. I mean, I've, you know, I, clearly the, you know, the kind of insights that we're getting from um, artificial neural networks has provided a, at least a, you know, food for thought, if not, um, you know, kind of a, a fundamental language. But I still, you know, I still feel like there's, um, there has to be some kind of way to talk about this that that accurately describes in a low dimensional way, you know, what going back to that earlier, you know, discussion, like, what is it that this particular, um, what is it that the computation is that's being done by mm -hmm. a particular circuit or, you know, area or network? But I, you know, I just haven't been able to kind of pin down exactly what that is yet. So, so you have a kind of a vision then of having a, I'm going to say computational language, even though it's not language, but a computational ontology, let's say, um, a formal computational ontology that when is it's used will eventually be able to apply whether it's new terms or existing terms used in reference to this to the particular ontology that low dimensional description we will have, even though the actual ontology will sort of be beyond uh, our description. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, okay. Well, I guess, I don't know if beyond our description is the right way to put it. I think that it'll be at a, a level that's necessarily imprecise mm -hmm. um, because it's a generalization, right? It's a low yeah. dimensional approximation of the, the higher dimensional model, which is a low dimensional approxima approximation of the actual thing, right? So there's all these, there's just like, you know, layer cake of approximations. But the, the question is like, do, you know, is there utility in having this very high level approximation? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I, you know, you know, sort of like statistical mechanics, right? It's a, it's a, a low dimensional description of all kinds of crazy stuff going on, but it's still useful for answering some kinds of questions. Yeah, I've started thinking uh, more and more about these types of things as uh, like attractor states, you know, in dynamical systems theory and even concepts, mental functions, right? Like, or let, let's say a uh, mental experience like pain, for instance, when you ask Jim what his pain is and you ask Sally what her pain is, they're not going to have, it's not like they have the same thing, the same actual thing going on, but we use the term pain, but it's almost like you could, it's pain is like this attractor uh, state that can vary in its actual location, but within a realm, right? And I wonder, going back to like the mental functions and the clustering aspect of it, is if it's good enough to just have sort of an attractor uh, surface, right? That all these, whether you divide it into 12 mental functions or three, uh, whether it's sufficient to say that it's within this sort of attractor state. Is that way off base? No, I, mean, I think that, you know, the whole question of sort of how we bring, you know, ideas from dynamical systems into our understanding of cognition is is really important. Um, you know, historically, there's been this, like, again, I think, you know, problematic dichotomy between, you know, like the people who do, you know, dynamical systems modeling and cognition in, in psychology, who've basically tried to say, oh, there's no representations in the brain, right? Yeah. Um, that we just need to do this dynamical system description. And then, you know, the people who want to build mechanistic models who say, oh, you, you know, those, the, the dynamical systems theory doesn't tell us anything about mechanism. So um, actually, there, there's a grad student in my lab right now, Grace Huckins, who's working uh, between myself and a couple of philosophers who's become really interested in this question of like, you know, how do we like, can we can we talk about the idea of like, you know, 
of dynamics as being explanatory, right? Yeah. Can we can we can we learn anything about, you know, about a system from these kind of dynamical systems analyses beyond uh just, you know, something that's a description. So I think that there's a lot of, you know, she hasn't uh, she doesn't have any <laughs> any sort of results to show she's for working. that yet, but but that's, <laughs> yeah. she's working on it. Yeah. So so um, you know, over the next few years I think we'll see something emerge from that. You know, I got pulled so I, you know, until a few years ago I never really thought about dynamical system stuff and then um had a postdoc in the lab Max Shine who's now um, faculty in Australia, who um, started, you know, kind of reading and thinking a lot about this sort of stuff and kind of dragged me kicking and screaming into it. And um, and I think that there really is something there. I think that, you know, one of the real challenges is trying to figure out, like, how do we bring together these ideas from dynamical systems and from kind of network neuroscience more broadly and ideas from kind of computational neuroscience that, uh, you know, in order to kind of come up with a, with a unified framework for thinking about, you know, about how we describe the function of brains. Mm -hmm. hey, maybe I'll have Mac on because uh, at some point, because I, I wanted to, there's too much to talk about. So, you know, there's, there's this paper from last year in Nature Neuroscience, um, human cognition involves the dynamic integration of neural activity and neuromodulatory systems, which um, it looks like great work. So, which you're the uh, last author on so um but maybe i'll have him on soon to talk about that stuff okay so uh, obligatory question here you know we think about mental functions and dividing them up i got into neuroscience in graduate school with the high aspirations of understanding consciousness and now i roll my eyes when i say it are we anywhere near given given you know the background of your work on on cognitive ontology do you see any promise Getting closer to approaching what consciousness is and how it would even fit into a cognitive ontology. I'm sorry, I'm still rolling my eyes. Let me, oh, let me okay. uh, All right. stop we, that. We can... <laughs> um, I mean, I think if somebody could come into the cognitive ontology and write down what the hell consciousness means, then um, <laughs> then that would be a great first start. How many clusters does consciousness have? That's a good question. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, uh, what, so what is your take? So I, I mentioned uh, Buzaki's. Uh, what he calls his inside out approach. And this is taking not without, it's not strictly bottom up or data driven. I mean, because uh, as he admits, there's, you always are working under a theory. So there's always that sort of top down uh, influence. But, uh, you know, his, his idea is that neuroscience, unlike many other fields, uh, has not developed its own vocabulary, its own, not even necessarily new words, but its own conceptual framework like other mature sciences have. And his idea is to take what we have found at, let's say, the implementation level, like oscillations and different patterns of oscillations, and 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 on and on, and use this inside-out approach to develop uh, concepts to, to maybe influence and change some psychological concepts, to change the ontology almost. So I'm wondering about your thoughts on that, and I'm not sure I described it well enough for you to even comment on it. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I I read parts of his book, and um, and I, you know, there's a lot to like about the book. I think you know, obviously, he's done amazing work on you know understanding dynamics of of neural systems and their role in behavior. The and I you know I really like the the focus of the book on you know, on action, right? On situating, you know, I think we, many of us still mm -hmm. have this kind of, you know, idea that kind of stuff comes into the eyes and then goes forward and action is like the thing in the end and kind of, you know, really kind of framing, you know, us as being, you know, embedded in these kind of, you know, action perception cycles. And there's, there's arguments in the book about kind of the primacy of action. I'm not sure I buy, but certainly the importance of action and our, and of our, you know, kind of uh, embeddedness in the world, I think is a, is a really important one. You see the brain as an information processor, not as a behavior producer, right? Primarily. I see it as both of those things, I guess. I mean, it's a, okay. I think there are different views on the same thing, right? That I think it processes information in service of generating behavior. And part of that, you know, generation of behavior is about generating the appropriate perceptual signals so that we can, you know, assess our predictive abilities and so on. It's very inclusive of you. Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I grew I up Lutheran, you. so you know, try to be very uh, ecumenical. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, you know, I um, first I would say that you know I think that I agree with the commentary by uh, David Popple and Adolfi that 
you know, Buzaki's philosophy of science is kind of broken. I think he really, I mean, he basically says, I think that that we need to free ourselves from prior assumptions, right? And if we we basically can look at the data and somehow this new taxonomy of mind will emerge. It's never clear to me from the book exactly how that happens um, because, you know, all the things he's talking about are kind of things that, you know, certainly memory and, you know, spatial navigation. These are all things that people were talking about well before anyone ever measured a brain. Well, he does the same thing in his talks as as you did in your blog post and as, as you've mentioned in your multiple of your talks is using William James's uh, uh, table of contents, you know, for instance, to talk about yep. how old these concepts are. And, and his take is that that we you both have the we need to re- revisit these concepts uh, take on it, but but from different philosophical vantage yeah. points. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, and I agree with him on that, right, that that we need to um, I, I think, you know, his. His strategy seems to be basically, let's throw it all out and then, you know, try to kind of build up from neural data some new functional description, quote unquote, without, you know, free of prior assumptions, um, which I think is just, you know, that's a that's a broken philosophy of science. Um, you just can't do that. So if you if you if you think you're working without uh, philosophical assumptions, then, you know, you're basically you just have on uh you know you, you have implicit philosophical assumptions that you haven't examined but in fairness to him he's not here to defend himself so I'll defend him that he he was at pains when we uh talked before to ba- I don't know if backtrack to, to explain that that is not his actual that he does have you know theoretical assumptions and that we all work from those and he does acknowledge those so it's somewhere in between it's it's being able to acknowledge them and throw them out eventually but but not go just from the ground up right. i suppose but uh I sh- yeah I, w- I won't defend yeah. him no I, that's but. fair i'm glad to hear that um i mean i think fundamentally the you know the the issue that i have is that i don't see you know if if somebody could show me an example of how this stuff works for something beyond you know these relatively you know something beyond stuff that rats do, right? Um, like, you know, behaving in the world uh, on relatively simple types of tasks, spatial navigation, you know, spatial memory, that sort of stuff. You know, I'm interested to see how this could work for understanding, say, you know, self-control or economic decision-making or, yeah. you know, very much higher yeah. level types of cognitive functions that um, that I think are, you know, are, are going to be very challenging to kind of, you know, have emerge Especially if you can't, even if you could study humans in the, you know, with all the tools you can use to study rodents, I don't think they would emerge. Um, but we can't, and so that makes it even harder. Agree with him that w- these are, you know, a, this is a framework that needs to be tested, and that's what we're, you know, going about trying to do. Yeah, I mean, it's the, this is the the big goal, it's the big dream, and this is what the cognitive ontology is all about, and every, this is what everyone everyone wants, right? To to bridge the the brain and mind. <laughs> okay, yep. well, s- switching gears here. Uh, so a self-driving car uh, probably doesn't need to fit in, in into any cognitive ontology, um, or, or does it? I mean, does does this does does a cognitive ontology matter for uh, building AI? And I know that this is loaded because it depends on what what AI you want to build, of course. But how how do you see? And we've already talked about the deep learning uh, aspect of AI. How do you see a cognitive ontology and in, in understanding the linkage between our brains and minds? Does that matter for AI? Um, so, I, you know, I'll speak to kind of artificial general intelligence, right? Kind of the most expansive sure. type of AI. And I think, you know, obviously, just because evolution built our mind in a particular way doesn't mean that that's the best way or that's the only way to build a system to solve the problems that we solve in the world right so i don't know that that necessarily it, you know that you you have to know anything about the ontology of the human mind in order to you know effectively build um uh, an agi system i think that what the place where it probably becomes really useful is thinking about what are the cognitive abilities or the cognitive tasks that humans can solve right because you want to, you know, if you're going to build a self-driving car, you need to basically know, like, what are all of the things one has to be able to do? What are all the the functions that a system needs in order to, you know, effectively engage in that, you know, repertoire of behaviors out in the world, right? Um, and so there, I think we, you know, just kind of thinking through, like, what are all the the things that, 
that one needs. So, you know, obviously working memory is going to be important because you're going to need to, you know, probably, you know, keep track of where all the things are around you, right? Um, episodic memory might be important because you need to remember, hey, last time I drove through here, some kids ran out in front of me, so that might happen again. So there, you, I think that one can certainly, you know, get uh, clues from cognitive ontology, but I think it's really, it's more kind of like the the task ontology than the function ontology that's probably more important for yeah. the people doing the building. Do you think that uh, building in the task ontology then the mental function ontology would naturally occur? Um, I don't... Or, do, or would that would that depend on the underlying uh, architecture of the system, for, you know, for example? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, in part because we, you know, uh, we rely on people being able to talk about things to, uh, you know, to, to get at some of these underlying functions. So I think that one, you know, one could probably you know, infer, it sort of gets back to our discussion earlier. Like, you know, you have, let's, let's take a really complex, you know, take like AlphaGo or something like, you know, a complex uh, deep reinforcement mm -hmm. learning system. Um, you can almost certainly put labels on parts of that system that are functional labels, right? I don't know the model well enough to know what those would be, but, um, but you almost certainly could like, you know, chop it up and, and say, you know, these are going to be, you know, this is this is the retina, if you will. You know, this is the thing that's uh, that's you know computing the the prediction error or doing the exploration or you know whatever those things might be, um, and that might or might not be useful, you know, for the person building that system. But I mean, it is interesting, right? That you know uh, that at least some of the recent work in reinforcement learning has been taking, uh, you know, basically episodic memory and building it into. Uh, into these deep reinforcement learning systems, so you you might think that that's. I mean, I don't I don't know where those intuitions came from, but I think they in part came from you know knowledge of how human brains work or how mammalian brains work. So thinking about the ontology uh, and how different cognitive tasks and the related mental functions, you know, there's this huge overlap, right? And um, you might have one cognitive task that. Uh, employs four different mental functions, and you might have one mental function that applies to twelve different cognitive tasks. And then there's that. I'll, I'll, I'll use the word emerges. That, you know, you have these higher functions that, um, whatever function is, uh, we give it a name, emerges through the interaction of these different uh, systems, right? These different lower, fine, finer grained um, mental functions. Let's say, might it be necessary then? for an AGI system, let's say, to ha be put together in such a way that these lower level, f more fine grained mental functions are interacting in such a way as to, you know, dynamically give where a higher mental function, quote unquote, uh, would, would be an emergent property of these lower level interacting uh, functions. Yeah, I think it's it's reasonable to think that 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 could be the case and that something could be learned from, you know, computational neuroscience and psychology that would help build those things. I don't, it's not a, you know, I'm not deep in the deep learning world, so I don't know, you know, to what degree those sort of insights have actually come to pass. It's like a reasonable strategy. So, so, okay. So in, in the, in the new mind readers, uh, I'm going to read a quote from you. Uh, you say, I was in graduate school in the, and you already mentioned this a little bit earlier. I was in graduate school in the early 1990s and had heard lots of hype about fMRI, but I wasn't available but it wasn't available at the University of Illinois, where I was a student. When I moved to Stanford as a postdoctoral fellow in 1995, I had not initially planned to do fMRI research, but I got pulled in by the excitement of this new technique. Just as a um, career-type uh, question, what do you take from that regarding being pulled in by a new exciting technique? And I'm thinking about deep learning in particular and deep reinforcement learning and all the hype the revolution, and I'm using air quotes, uh, of AI that has recently happened, you know, would you be pulled in? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm cynical enough in general that, you know, if I were to be pulled in, I'd probably end up being one of those like, you know, internal critics, kind of like I've been in the <laughs> fMRI world. Um, right, so I, I, right. that actually wouldn't surprise me. And I think, you know, um, I mean, I think actually some of the really cool work that's going on right now, even though it's, you know, I understand it at best at kind of like a, you know, a storytelling way is a lot of the theoretical neuroscience work that's trying to understand, you know, why is it that neural networks 
you know work well or don't for particular problems from a from a you know a fundamental theory standpoint and so so i could see getting pulled into asking those kinds of questions <laughs> okay yeah i like that getting pulled in and just just to uh be a nuisance exactly <laughs> <laughs> to use the techniques and and be a nuisance what well, Russ, have we missed anything about uh cognitive ontology that um that you wanted to touch on because i have i have other sort of general and career type questions for you yeah no let's move on okay so you're productive. In fact, you've um, written on your blog post multiple times about your productivity stack. Uh, and people are impressed that you s- somehow maintain a career fixing neuroscience and psychology plus doing neuroscience and psychology. What's the secret? How do you, how do you maintain such a healthy balance in your uh, approach and, and, and your productivity while still being very productive? You're assuming that I actually maintain a healthy balance. <laughs> no, actually, I think I do. I know you eat a lot of brisket, and I know that's not healthy. Right. But. Oh, it's very healthy, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think the short answer is just that I really love a lot of what I do, and so um, you know, I don't, I don't really consider it work. Like, I, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I really want to go like do that analysis or you know go read that uh, paper, and so you know, I do work a ton, but I, I think the the thing that that helps me maintain the balance is having pretty strict rules about not letting my academic pursuits negatively affect the other parts of my life, right? So, so I, for example, I refuse to let work keep me from sleeping. If there's something that has to be done and the only way it's going to get done is if I stay up all night, then it's just not going to get done, right? And I also refuse to let work get in the way of exercise or time with my wife or, you know, practicing guitar, I, you know, I feel like these are, there are things that one has to do to remain, you know, reasonably balanced in one's life. Um, and I certainly, you know, occasionally I'll like spend, especially these days, you know, where everything's happening on Zoom, you know, I'll end up spending, you know, eight hours in a day in my chair and I just feel trashed afterwards. Um, and yeah. so that's about as, you know, I, I try not to even let myself do that. Obviously, sometimes one can't help it. Got to go on podcasts and stuff. <laughs> exactly. How important is it that you have this innate drive? I don't remember the term that you used, how you described yourself earlier, if it was nerd or um, just computational uh, intrigued person, but you have this sort of innate drive toward the um, analytical side of things and, and the computational side of things. And there's almost a antithesis between that and sort of want, just pondering the higher questions, right? Uh, and, you know, what is mental function in general? So I don't know, you seem to have this really nice balance. Do you think that that is really important to have this passion for the analytics of things with asking, being able to ask the higher questions? I mean, for me, it certainly has been, you know, I spent, it's interesting, I, I minored in philosophy as an undergrad and actually spent in grad school, even though I was in grad school for, you know, cognitive psychology, I actually spent a lot of time reading philosophy of mind, philosophy of science sort of work. And, and I think that that's, it's probably obvious that, that I've done that, right? Because I think it's, you know, kind of in, in infected the way that yeah. I, the way that I think and write. So, um, so, you know, I, for me, I think that, you know, that there's, there's a lot to be said for having a mixture of that, you know, of those different ways of thinking about things. I think that, you know, and in general, I think that people who think but obviously, there's you know there's room for lots of different types of people in science, right? We need the people who are going to really be kind of you know very hard nosed, you know, focused on a particular question, digging in as deeply as they can, building really you know kind of detailed theories. Um, and then I think you know, but I just constitutionally couldn't do that, right? Um, I think we also need people more like me who really kind of you know look very broadly, try to kind of you know bring together ideas from lots of different sources, um, and uh, and you know it's been it's been successful and fun for me. Yeah, whatever you're doing, it seems like it's um, uh, fun and uh, rewarding. <laughs> Indeed. So you have been impressively productive, uh, and I assume everything has gone just perfectly for you throughout your career. <laughs> but if it hasn't, I'm, oh, okay, good. I'm wondering if, I mean, have you ever felt disillusioned or or have you ever had a major failure, you know, um, for whatever reason? And and if so, t- I'd love to hear about it <laughs> and how you overcame it. Well, you know, yeah, I I've, I've felt disillusioned at a lot of points. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think I've, you know, 
because I'm a, a cynic, I'm kind of continually <laughs> disillusioned. That's your base base. Exactly, state. right. Yeah. Or, or maybe I just look for, you know, I'm like searching for disillusionment. But I guess, you know, my my stress so, you know, for example, I've been the last few years I've been really deeply disillusioned about the way that everyone else have done fMRI studies since I started doing it back in the nineties. You know, both because of all the methodological issues, the analytic flexibility that, you know, basically allows pretty much any study to find a positive result. But more importantly, because I think that even if right. we did the methods right, I think the strategy that we've been using wouldn't be able to actually answer the questions we want to answer. Um, so, so you know, what I've done is turn that into, you know, trying to figure out how I can actually do some work that tries to address the problem. So, you know, on the analytic flexibility side, you know, we, we've, I've talked for a while about, you know, the fact that, you know, there's there's so many different ways to analyze an fMRI data set, and we've known for a long time that that these can lead to different results, but we didn't really know kind of you know to what degree that actually has impact in the real world. So we we did a study last year that came out earlier this year. We call it the NARP study, where you know basically we we had 70 different groups analyze a real fMRI data set, test a set of hypotheses, and tell us you know basically. Uh, what they found, and we found a really a um, kind of a disconcerting amount of disagreement in what they found, um, and we dug in, you know, a lot to uh, to try to figure that out. But that was, you know, that was a step to that was really inspired by by my disillusionment. And then, you know, I also that also the the, the work that I did for that project. So I wrote most of the analysis code for the project last uh, summer before this last one. Wow. And it was really that experience that kind of spurred me to become much more interested in software engineering practices and that I've, you know, continued with. So I, I think I try to overcome disillusionment through action. Had you not written code in a while and that's why it was a bad experience? No, I um I mean I I've in some ways like the the thing I like most about this job is the fact that I still get to write code right <laughs> pretty regularly. So I've, you know, I started coding when I was in high school, you know, back when you saved your program to a cassette tape. <laughs> oh, not even a floppy? It was a like, No, no, no. This was uh, I had a, a TI 994A oh, okay. um, and I programmed in basic on it. So I've been programming <laughs> for a long time and and really enjoy it, but had never really, you know, I I I'm totally self-taught. I've taken like one CS uh. course in my life. And so uh so there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of learning to do around that. But it was really kind of like, you know, um, just trying to – what what happened was, you know, we're, this is a project on reproducibility. And I was like, well, we kind of need to make this as reproducible as possible. And so yes. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to think about like what is the best – when talking to people trying to figure out like what is the best way to make this thing as reproducible as possible. I still need to write something about exactly what we did. It's kind of like there implicitly in the methods section, but I haven't written anything about it. Hmm. Well, what about other, I mean, have you been disillusioned in your like, career? So that's what you're talking about is almost a, um, it's like a scientific disillusionment, right? But have you ever, have you ever thought, oh, I shouldn't go on because the field is so rife with difficulties or, you know, didn't think that um, you had the chops or something like that? I, I doubt that's the case. You know, I always feel like I don't have the chops. I think, you know. <laughs> yeah. The way you approach things, it seems like, uh, is the way that uh, sci the ideal uh, hypothesis uh, approach to science is, is that you, you seek to fail. <laughs> That's the way that you seem to approach science. Yeah, it's not, it, it's not exactly the most psychologically healthy way <laughs> of dealing with, with life, but, but I think it's actually pretty effective for science. <laughs> seems to be. How would you, uh, lastly, Russ, if you were going to begin again, um, do you have an idea of how you would start over if you were starting over right now? Um, let's say in, in grad, thinking about going going into graduate school or early in graduate school. I think the main thing I would do is wear earplugs at rock shows so that I wouldn't need a hearing aid in my fifties. <laughs> you have a hearing aid? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, I have probably pretty sub substantial hearing loss. I think both from like going to way too many rock shows, you know, playing in bands in high school. And then also, you know, I grew up in Texas. We shot a lot of guns as kids. And yes. I don't remember wearing any hearing, hearing protection when we were shooting guns. So I think all those things kind of have kind of blown my hearing. I'm from Texas. Where, where did you grow up in Texas? Uh, outside of uh, Houston, Rosenberg. Okay. Yeah. I'm from the Dallas area. Okay. Beautiful, wonderful areas. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> okay, so but, okay, so back to your question. Besides wearing the uh, ear protection, which I think is a great idea, I have a friend right. with tinnitus because of the same reasons. You yeah. Know? Um, so I, I guess the question is: Am I starting again now, or am I starting in back in the day? Young Russ. Young Russ. Um, I, I'm not sure what I would do differently, other than like maybe being more disciplined about like learning, particularly computational skills, because I've been really kind of haphazard in how I've learned them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think so much of success is just like luck and like uh, capitalizing on luck. And I was like really lucky to, you know, I was really lucky to end up at Mass General Hospital in, you know, in uh, the late 90s. I was really, you know, lucky to to end up at Stanford at a time when fMRI was taking off. I've been really lucky to kind of end up around, you know, various colleagues at the various places I've been. And I don't know that I'd want to change any of that. I went to undergraduate at the University of Texas at Austin. What do you miss about Austin? Anything? Uh, Barbecue. (laughs) Are you making brisket these days? Uh, Occasionally. I don't don't smoke brisket very often just because it's such an ordeal. Though I've started, you know, usually you would do it low and slow and then you're smoking for like, you know, 16 hours. Um, But I've tried the hot and fast method and it's actually pretty good. And, you know, you can get it done in a day. So that's not too bad. But I'll usually smoke, you know rib like either uh beef ribs or pork ribs or uh pork shoulder or things like that see i'm not sure i'm a true texan because i think brisket is overrated but i I have had really good brisket i've had really good brisket but most brisket i've had is not good brisket and i think you can have bad ribs and they're still pretty good if you have bad brisket it's not good i would agree with that so russ this has been very fun very enlightening um i really appreciate it and, and continue the great work that you're doing Thanks very much. It's been uh, great to chat with you. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.